excited by the analogy that, that Dr. Albert mentioned earlier because I'm now into urban farming so um, or gardening in my small balcony. And the fact that um, he referred to education as the soil really resonated with me. So uh, once again, my name is Love Basilio and I represent Philippine Business for Education. Before anything else, I'd like to introduce to you PBED. Who are we? Um, we are a group, an advocacy group, composed of the, the country's leading business leaders passionate about quality education for all. Our vision is simple. Education should lead to productive lives. Productive lives should reinforce what we teach in, in education. So we don't know what the future holds, right? But we envision a competitive Philippines in which uh, every Filipino will lead a productive life through relevant education. Uh, I won't be, I'm supposed to talk about how the education sector should respond to the fourth industrial revolution. Unlike usual teachers, I will not give you all the, the questions and then give you the answer later. I will give you the answer right away because it's also lunchtime. Um, there are um, three things that we think in Philippine Business for Education is important in making sure that we educate for a future that works, that works for everyone. If you are, um, I will have 500 slides after this one, so you don't need to remember all those, but remember, remember this slide and then the three main points. And I'm hoping that these are your three main takeaways after you listen to me in the next five hours or so. So lifelong learning, making sure that we emphasize lifelong learning, the importance of data and information, and number three, partnerships. And I think many of my colleagues here today have already talked about many of, of the things about fourth industrial revolution. So I will emphasize these three points. Um, also, before I proceed, I'd like to thank PIDS for PIDS for inviting us and making us part of this conversation. We think that this is a very inform, um, important conversation to have, and it's good to have the education sector be part of it and not just an afterthought, which usually happens in many of the innovation talks, right? You, you talk about people in the end. So, um, yeah, these are the three main key takeaways. You don't need to listen to everything else. I don't have a crystal ball, but I'd like to argue that I'm a, a competent optimist. My colleagues before talked about all these disruptions, all the things that should really make us scared, right? Um, imagine the, what's the name of that humanoid from Hong Kong who's like talking, she's prettier than I am. She's gonna replace me, right? But, but all that to say that um, should, we, should we then ask, we should then ask ourselves the question, should I be afraid? Um, in my case, I, I don't need to be afraid because I'm generally an optimistic person, but not a blindly optimistic person, but a competent one, making sure that you know I'm learning as I go through life. I have data and I talk to people and, and enter into different partnerships. Um, and this is precisely why I'd like to hinge, uh, this is where I'd like to hinge my talk today on. We create these technologies. We actually essentially created the environment for the fourth industrial revolution. We can make fire work for us. We can make, um, we make the fourth industrial revolution work for the good of humanity and for a world, to create a world that we want to live in. So these are just, so basically this slide talks about what drives us in Philippine business for education. Our country is such a young country. Um, it's quite discouraging to see that in the rankings we're you know, ranked low, etc. But you know what, we're one of the youngest countries in the world. We're also one of the youngest democracies of the world. Um, our median population age is 23 years old. Um, that's like the age of my youngest brother. Uh, we are a growing country of 105 million maybe every minute. I think, I don't know how many babies are born. This number is rising. Um, but then also, many of, many of our uh, country men and women don't have jobs, especially the youth. Uh, and, and especially, and even those who have had some education don't have jobs, even in the context of a growing economy. That should make us also you know, uh, ask ourselves the question, okay, what should we do to make sure 
that fire benefits everyone, all these numbers that are posted here. Um, I'm, I'm a Harry Potter geek, so if you look at the, oh, is there a pointer in this thing? Okay, here. That's basically like a photo of Hogwarts when they enter, when they enter Hogwarts for the first time and they're being led to their houses. There are four houses in Hogwarts, right? And if you've seen the movie, you will see that there, there are staircases that move in various directions. But, which was quite scary, because wow, what are all these ramps and like stairs? But at the end of the day, they are led to the houses where they're supposed to be. So essentially, what, what, what's my question here? How do we enable people to move up, down, sideways, to success, to whatever life they want to lead, right? To a productive life that they can all have. Um, and, and basically, in terms of education, in a context where you know, the world is really volatile, unpredictable, complex and um, ambiguous. What are these on and off ramps for success? Um, and again, I'd like to take you back to those three points that I mentioned. I think those are the, the three important ramps that should be in place um, for us to, to adapt to this changing world. Um, my colleagues talked about this a lot, and they mentioned the McKinsey, the McKinsey um, statistic a lot, which is like 48% of jobs, job functions can be automated with existing technology. The, the, the modifier that everyone should note in this particular uh, statistic is actually existing, right? It's not technology that's still to be, that is still to be created. It's what we have now. And the context, I mean, the theme of, of, of this month's um, DPRM is actually the future today because we are living in this fourth industrial revolution. This isn't something that is, you know, far off, right? And 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 what's important to note here is that jobs will be destroyed. Jobs will be created with existing technology. But what's important is the speed by which these jobs will be created will be destroyed. Another statistic that I don't think anyone has mentioned yet, they say that people, that sixth graders now, first graders now, will be, will have up to, or at least eight careers in their lifetime. Not jobs, huh? careers. Um, and they will be doing jobs that don't exist yet, and will change. So what, how do we make sure that we, we actually take part in all of these things and everyone can benefit, right? Can lead productive lives. Another thing that contributes to my optimism, we are not unique, right? We like to think that, oh, Filipinos are the best, which is true. We, I don't think no one will, no one will, anyone will argue with me on that. But these, these challenges, these disruptions, are something that not only the Philippines is experiencing. A lot of other countries are doing this, are, are, simil are facing similar challenges. And in many of the countries that were, dis that were um, especially for example Singapore, in many successful cases, partnerships matter. It's really partnerships that allow them to adapt, to harness fire to their advantage. So Skills Future is one where every Singaporean is given training money so that, because they're the ones who are in charge of their learning, they know what the needs are, they know what they need to learn to reskill, upskill in order for them to have a job um, in the 21st century Singapore. So that's the that's the the design of it. But what's interesting in that model is actually not the money, although that's also interesting, right? What's interesting is that it's not it's not by the education ministry of Singapore. This is a um, interagency organization, they call it the Future Economy Council, and it's actually led by the Department of Finance. I'm not saying that we follow that, right? We, we make the OF secretary the head of the Future Economy Council of the Philippines. But it, may, it begs the question, education, is it really for everyone, or is it really just the accountability of the educators? I would argue that it's not. Because 
even in, for example, VTEC, that's an IBM um, New York City public school system program where uh, people, kids, are subjected to IBM work standards. They learn how to code, to, to, to basically work in an, in an IBM workplace. But they get a certificate um, in, from their school and also in IBM and they're like, they, they transition from school to workforce mostly. And so again, partnerships, right? So how can non-traditional actors become involved in education? So I will go back to my three points. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, you will indulge me in, in talking more about these three points. On lifelong learning, what do we mean by that? It's really cradle to grave intervention for lifelong learning. Readiness, number one, readiness to learn. If many of our kids are stunted, wasting, don't have the mental, literal mental brain capacity to learn, how can we actually develop all of these technologies, make sure that they're employed in, a, in, a, in the fourth, in fire, in a fire context, right? We can. So we, we need to make sure that, you know, nutrition, supplementation at home, DOS, um, DP, no, sorry, uh, DSWD, DOH are involved, the National Feeding Program um, law that was just recently promulgated is really a good thing. We want to make sure that kids are ready to learn as they, they transition from home to school. Now, once they are in school, we need to make sure that the gains from all of these feeding programs, early childhood care and development interventions, don't go to waste. Like in other countries, that happens, right? So schools are there to build and build on competencies that are needed to make sure that people are able to lead productive lives or be able to choose the life that they want to live. Um, my, my colleagues already mentioned the three different types of competencies, right? Like foundational uh, competencies, uh, technical competencies, and, and character um, characteristics or values. I'd like to focus on the character um, values because that's really something that will facilitate lifelong learning, which is curiosity, the willingness to learn. I mentioned that I'm doing urban farming now, and for some reason, I'm so frustrated because my eggplant keeps on flowering, keeps on flowering, but it doesn't turn into an actual eggplant. So sorry about all my, my effort, right? And so I was I was so curious why, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and how how to actually pollinate flowers and everything. And um, my curiosity, I, I didn't know that actually for eggplant, especially because I live in a condo and it's high up, there are no butterflies, so there are no natural pollinators. I, I, I discovered that eggplants actually are, um, they can self-pollinate, but you need to shake them and you need to like move the flowers around and you can use like an electric toothbrush to basically make the flowers vibrate so that it, it, it pollinates. It gets, it gets, you know, pollinated, right? But things like that, like that willingness to learn, I'm saying that we should probably instill that in our kids so that when they read news on social media, when they post something, they know what is fake news. They can discern what is, what is real and what is not and decide for themselves, right? And then um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Moya said, that there will be disruptions in the workplace. This is something that not a lot of people talk about yet here, but employers are actually very active here um, when it comes to retraining, upskilling, reskilling, because this is really important. Um, even though we are a young population, uh, there are also people in our in our country that are old and might not be able to to partake in this fourth industrial revolution. So we want to make sure that, especially for certain industries where the retirement, informal retirement age is a bit early or young, or for example, when your industry is no longer um, here, like for example, yung sapatero, di ba? Parang, ay, matawag ba? Cobbler, sorry, in English. Like, it's, that's something that, you know, it's, it's disappearing. So how do we retrain these people in new skills that will make sure that they will still ha have jobs? In, in our current economy. 
Secondly, it's data. We need to be informed to make better decisions. We need, we need information and data to know when to stop something. Once we've started something, kasi nasasayangan tayo, we tend to say, ay sayang, let's not, you know, let's continue pa rin, even though it's not working anymore. But data is important, or information is important for us to know when to stop, when to start something new, and when to continue something that is already being done. Um, our friends from the government mentioned so many of their programs that are quite, quite um, impressive, really, and I, and I think that we should continue supporting them. And secondly, sources of information need to be diversified, verified, and secure. Um, Mr. Moya said that employers don't actually know the skills that they need, or at least cannot articulate. But they are actually very good sources of information for understanding what the world will be like, what the world of work will be like. And we need to make sure that we involve them as we develop these labor market intelligence systems. Um, but we need to make sure that these, the information that we put up are verified and they are secure, right? Um, and then lastly, partnerships. When, when it comes to education, people always think that it's just the educator's job to do that. It's the teacher's job to do that. Education is limited to what happens in the classroom. But we would argue, we argue that it's not. And partnerships, as like in other countries that have successfully um, harnessed the potentials of the fourth industrial revolution, partnerships matter. Traditional actors um, should come together. So PBED had a program on bringing together all the educators together, both from public and private schools. And actually, one of the things that they noticed was they're experiencing similar problems, right? And so probably the solutions are also similar and shared. And so they are now currently working together to make sure that education is responsive to the needs of industry. Other traditional actors that we don't really think about um, when it comes to education are parents and even grandparents and, and, the, and the wider family in general. Uh, I, was, I was on a panel with Dr. Albert for an ADB uh, survey on how youth and, and families invest in education. And one interesting finding was that actually kids refer to their parents or defer to their parents when making educational decisions. It's the parents that make the decision in a Filipino household when it comes to education. And so making sure that parents are also involved, um, they are aware of all of these information so that educational investments can be maximized. And I cannot, men I cannot mention enough employers um, and, and industry in this conversation. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones who are aware of what the trends are, where the jobs are, what are the skills requirements are. And we need to make sure that they are part of the conversation when it comes to setting standards um, in the curriculum. So we're currently working with the Commission on Higher Education to make sure that industry is involved in the setting of standards um, in the CHED technical panels, for example. We're working with the, the PQF IRR um, working group so that um, industry inputs will be will be included in the way we design our competency standards. And civil society, of course, is, is very important because at the end of the day, we live in a society where civic engagement um, is very important. We, we currently define and redefine what it means to be Filipino, and civil society needs to be there to make sure that we, we, we actually co co-develop and co-identify what, what the Philippines in this 21st century would look like. And um, lastly, our government partners, they really should enable and make sure that all of these partnerships grow and foster. Um, so again, three things. How, what can schools do? How might we make sure that the future works for every Filipino? We need to emphasize lifelong learning that not just involves schools, but also a wider community, where we make sure that we have information and data that will guide our decision making and the policies that we will put forward to benefit as many Filipinos as possible, and, and making sure that partnerships exist and are fostered and are developed and sustained 
so that we we can really harness the potentials of this fourth industrial revolution. So I leave you with this with this statement. Let us all educate. We I look forward to working with you to make sure that we educate for a humanity that makes sense for everyone um, of us, for our families, and for our loved ones. So let us all actively choose to educate for humanity. Thank you very much, Shalom.